Welcome to Uncontained, episode 181. I'm your host, Aaron Static Render, and on the show today, I speak with actor and musician Robert Felstead Jr., and uh, we talk about his upcoming movie called Hanukkah, and I know you're probably thinking like Eight Crazy Nights or something with Adam Sandler, but no, this is the story of the Hanukkah Killer, and uh, it's uh, starring Charles Fleischer, PJ Souls, and also the recently late horror film icon Sid Haig and uh, you you may know him as Captain Spaulding from Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses movies he's in this along with uh, Robert and uh, Robert shares some stories from the set Sid did pass away after uh, the interview with Robert so it's not talked about in the interview it just happened Monday and my condolences go out to Sid's family that survives him so um, as I mentioned that is recent so it's not talked about in the interview we do talk about some other stuff including experiences he had on the set with the cast that he's worked with and uh, some other gigs that he has had as an actor including a stand-in for Andy Sandberg and a little extra work on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. We also talked about the days that uh, Robert was in a band touring, trying to make a living through music and performing it. Now he's kind of changed his direction with the music with the music career in uh, writing music for placement in film. So we'll jump into that as well. All right, plug in your earbuds and hit subscribe on your favorite podcast player if you haven't done so already. This is how Robert Falstead Jr. lives uncontained. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm good. I uh, just just came from an audition, uh, feeling good, had my uh, horror scream on. And, uh, oh, nice. Yeah, I'm amped up. <laughs> nice. So was, when I was talking to you to get you set up to come on the show, you were uh, flying to Vegas. Was that what you were doing in Las Vegas? No, that is uh, – so that was actually a different project. Uh, I've been working as like a, a sound guy on a documentary for about three years now about the, okay. city, of, about the city of Compton. And uh, we were really? interviewing – yeah, we were interviewing this guy, C.T. Fletcher, and sort of following him around – the Mr. Olympia uh, competition. All right. I, I look at you. I see Compton. All <laughs> yeah, right. Like, exactly right. <laughs> so how, how do you get involved with a documentary about Compton? Uh, well, you said I'm a musician and an actor, but um, that stuff started very early on in life. Like when I was a kid, I'd be in plays and I played, you know, in bands and stuff, played jazz when I was like 10. But then you know, after high school, I was like, oh, I just got this guitar that that'll I'll make a living that way. Right. (laughs) And my parents were like, fuck that, (laughs) you know, not a chance. So I I learned how to be a a recording engineer. Uh, Okay, I was like a trade. And um, so it it just so happened. My first job out of college was with Murder, Inc. So I was mixing like rap albums and, you know, just sort of pickup gigs and just more and more like African American projects and communities have just sort of accepted me more and more. And I get involved with these cool projects that I'm a fish out of water, but it's like, uh, I'm almost like a outside observer in a lot of, of these interviews okay yeah that yeah. has to be that has to be interesting to be like a fly in the wall with like the murder ink crew or yeah. something like that that was with like ja rule right yep ja rules foxy brown uh i <laughs> i did a session that lil wayne was in before he you know anyone <laughs> knew who he was he was just a weird kid that would come around so you know i didn't know any of these people i just had a gig and yeah you know, sort of was impartial and could kind of speak from an engineer standpoint and, you know, a musician standpoint. And I sort of had all these other informants in my life, you know, in my work. Okay. So, like, all right. So from an engineer (laughs) standpoint, working on a rap record versus working on, like, 
you know, a rock record. Yeah. How does your job differ in those two, those two areas? Um, okay. Well, like a hip hop record, it, a lot of it's improvised. A lot of it's like pieced together, piecemealed. And you are sort of the inventory taker of all these pieces that you're okay. going to have to probably string together later, you know, or you're going to have to find what may be the hook that one thing that's like the inspiration that they're just improvising off of. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you got to find basically the catchy part, what everybody's going to know on the record pretty much. R- right. Whereas like a band, they're sort of, they have the thing and you want to just be, do the best job of capturing that. Whereas like a hip hop session is more made in the moment, typically um, as far okay. as songwriting. All right. All right. Very cool. So so you're working on this documentary on Compton for the last three years. Is it a series or is it going to be one big project coming out? I believe it'll be a a series. A series? Um, Yeah. Probably early 2020. All right. Um, If you can't say anything else on that, I'll I'll stop pushing. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Non-disclosure agreements are always fun. Mm-hmm. I do know something you can talk about. Yes. And uh, it's a horror movie. Yes. Hanukkah. So tell us a little bit about mm-hmm. Hanukkah and uh, how gory that gets. I saw the preview. <laughs> you, oh, so you saw the trailer. For I, it. I saw the trailer. It looks pretty <laughs> dark, but, you know, I want you to you to explain it instead of like me just talking about bloody people in bathtubs. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot to it, man. Like, you know, there's a lot of, you know, references to like older horror movies and things like that. Um, but there's a lot of people that were in like awesome horror movies that are in this movie. So like Sid Haig, he was just in Three from Hell, uh, Devil's Rejects, okay. all that, Coffee, Spider Baby, you know. He's like 80 and he was, you know, he's the lead in that movie. Um, Dick Miller, who was in all the Roger Corman movies, all the, uh, he was in the Burbs, all the, all those movies, the Gremlins. Uh, he, it was his final film. Uh, I got to do a bunch of scenes with Charles Fleischer, who was was in Zodiac. Like he was, he was Roger Rabbit. He was basically my, my hero growing up. <laughs> <laughs> and I got, From Roger you know, Rabbit to the Zodiac film, huh? That's quite a jump. Yeah. <laughs> this guy, like, looking back, and I was like, he's been in everything. Welcome back, Cotter, like, Back to the Future, like, all this stuff that you never realized he was in. And uh, I got to, you know, act at him for four days or whatever. That's cool. So what what role do you play in the film? I, I know you're not the uh, not the killer. No. <laughs> or maybe you are. I don't know. It could be a twist. Horror movies are notorious for that. But uh, mm-hmm. what what is your role? So this is essentially like almost like a legend of the, the Hana killer is, uh, you know, this guy who who was a murderer and, you know, had this extreme um, extreme views and kill people and all that back in the eighties. Now his son's grown up. So, <laughs> you know, history repeats itself. And, uh, you know, we're me and these crop of like kids, you know, young people are the unsuspecting okay. Jewish people. You know, it's the first Jewish <laughs> it's the first Jewish slasher film ever made. The first Jewish slasher film. All right, yeah, I was gonna say I haven't yeah. heard of too many of those, but that that's groundbreaking right there, yeah. you know. You hear a movie called Hanukkah, you think it's gonna be like <laughs> eight crazy nights or something like that yeah. with Adam Sandler, and then you get your first Jewish slasher film. That's yeah. That's I, impressive, I, man. You know, I'm sort of like a, a loud mouth, so I'm a, a bit of the comedic relief in in the film but it's uh i mean it's fun it gives you everything you want and breaks your heart (laughs) like (laughs) it's just i i honestly like love this movie so i make it a point to tell people because i can't wait for the world to see this thing yeah so when is it coming (laughs) out dude like when can i actually see more than like a minute trailer there's no official release date but i believe it'll be this calendar year Okay, and can we expect like a theater release on this, or 
will it be like a prime Netflix movie? Like you'll probably find out before I do. And then I'll tell everyone. <laughs> All right. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. So I'm, I'm looking to see that. Uh, what was it like working on screen with some of those like legends in, in horror right there from uh, working with people from Devil's Rejects and the Zodiac Killer and maybe just maybe being their victim? <laughs> it was it was cool because you know i i the character i play almost has the type of viewpoint that i would like i feel like i'm very uh close to the character i play <laughs> you know um you know i didn't a lot of horror movies people have to do stuff that they're not happy about <laughs> you yeah know, sometimes i was cool with everything i had to do <laughs> it was it was a fun movie to make and like it had at times it had like an Ed Wood sort of vibe to it, but then, interesting. Yeah, it just sort of evolved on its own during filming, and once I got to see it, I would, couldn't believe it. Right on. Horror movies are fun. Like I was like kind of involved in. I don't know. I guess you could call it like a fan fiction type movie. It was like or mm-hmm. some that somebody was hoping to get into festivals. It was a uh, a Halloween movie. Michael Myers. I actually got to play Michael Myers and like stab people and you know it's a nice break from reality but you know i find myself wanting to just walk down the street slashing people (laughs) you really get into it you know i'm a method actor what can i say (laughs) also you know pj souls from uh from halloween is uh in the film really she's the one who like her her they think her boyfriend is uh like Michael Myers is wearing the sheet over his head and she's like, see anything you like. (laughs) Okay. Very cool, man. Very cool. So, um, now along with that, what else are you working on right now? Anything else you can talk about? Um, well, I just, uh, I contributed a couple songs to this, uh, this film, um, addicted to you. That should be coming out in the, in the spring. I think like, or not the spring in the fall. And is this um, with your band Moon Shoots? Yep, the Moon Shoots. Okay. Um, we have like the title credits track and then a couple other songs throughout the film. And it's like a, you know, sort of fun, I don't know, I guess millennial comedy. So okay. That, you know, it'll be on Redbox and eventually streaming. Okay, very cool, man. Very cool. So how do, like, how do you get set up with uh, song placement in movies? Um, I mean, my path is very, like, I'm sort of scrappy, you know. It's a, I, get, <laughs> I get in, like, just sort of being, like, helping out on sets that your your friends are working on or, you know, being starting to be an extra. Like, I when I first moved to L.A. six years ago, some friends of mine had a YouTube channel called Third String Kicker. And um, they had about like 100,000 subscribers at that point. And they were able to use the YouTube space and sort of make these videos that a lot of people would see for not a lot of money. Okay. So, I, so I would start volunteering with them. And, um, you know, I look like this. So they would just throw me in scenes, um, <laughs> you know, and then eventually you know, I'd get the biggest laugh or something or they'd like it. So they'd write stuff for me. And I started getting more and more work just from being in those circles. You know, other YouTube channels would reach out with video, with, you know, ideas for videos for me to be in when I was just kind of like one of the guys on set, I didn't really take, I wasn't pursuing acting. Okay. But, but just being on set and sort of being like, helpful and being uh just giving and trying to not be a pain in the ass uh really goes a long way (laughs) i hear i hear that's a big thing don't be a dick on set (laughs) yeah you're you know you're there you've chosen to be there you know make the best of it and good things come to you for sure you're you're from the east coast right Mm mm-hmm all right. So, were you in film or like working with like a film at all before you moved to Hollywood, or was that your aspiration? Yeah. Uh, my I moved here to uh, write songs for movies and commercials, and uh, you know, just to start writing music and make money like that way. Because traveling wasn't really a sustainable way of making money as a musician. 
Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that gets costly. And booking your mm-hmm. own tours is tough. I have friends and bands that have done that. And it's like yeah. playing for two people and free PBR pretty much, you know? It's like, <laughs> that's yeah. always the beer. That's always the beer they'd give away for some reason. Uh huh. <laughs> Tall boys of PBR. And, you know, we, I did that for years. Like we, um, you know, I had a band and we lived together for three years, just sort of touring. And we had a house in New Jersey. And we'd have we people would hire us to record their music. So I'd have a studio. We'd be the band. We record your songs for you, kind of thing. Okay. And at one point, we were so broke that we there was this one guy who had an album, and he would pay us in frozen chicken because he was a chicken <laughs> salesman, and he had like the hula, <laughs> he had the hula hands account for the Northeast, and he would <laughs> pay us in frozen chicken. And that's how we survived. Wow, <laughs> man. Wow. Well, you know, you got to make ends meet however you can, even if it is recording for frozen chickens, man. That's that's kind of, you know, that, that's a story right there for uh, behind the music later on, if that ever comes back. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, we were we were doing our own thing. We would have been playing music anyway, so might as well eat, too. <laughs> exactly man exactly um my friends went out and got like quit their jobs and got food stamps before they went on tour and <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea i would never thought to do anything like that yeah it was after the first time they went on tour and basically many a nights their meal was a spoonful of peanut butter from uh the skippy jar or yeah. something like that like we're not doing that again walmart's used to let you hang out in the parking lot, like if you had like a van or like a pot camper or something. So we had like a Coleman grill and we would grill ground beef, a bottle of, or a box of mac and cheese. And that was maybe spinach. And that was what we ate that day. <laughs> gotta, gotta have the greens, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, man. But that was in my 20s. Fair enough, man. <laughs> I understand. So uh, we were talking just a little bit before the show. You mentioned you were starting up a podcast of your own, correct? Yeah. Um, so I had been, um, the my wife and I, we're the moon shoots. Um, okay. We write music together and record and stuff. Um, and we had been the house band for this show at the Improv uh, in Hollywood for about two years. And it was a comedy game show. Um, so we sort of toyed with different game show ideas. And now we're doing a podcast about game okay. shows called the Game Show Gurus. Ah, okay. So are you going to have guests come on and play games or is it just talking about game shows? Well, our host is like, an, he's an aspiring game show host, essentially. And um, we're going to basically just analyze uh, one uh, one show each episode. So The Price is Right. Um, we talked about, we compared Bob Barker to Drew Carey. Okay. And talked about the difference in the games and the setup and how, you know, it, the prices of everything were had zeros at the end instead of 99 or, you know, the how they had like almost borderline offensive sketches, you know, in the <laughs> in the 80s on the prices right where it's sort of just more uh slick and clean now. Yeah. And yeah. Stuff like that. Okay, and they 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 at least still keep the theme of spaying and neutering pets. You know that that's gone through. I think that was like in the contract for Drew Carey to sign. You must talk about spaying and neutering pets. I don't I don't care what the cost of it is, uh, but it's worth it for the job. I know I would too, man. And <laughs> shit, <laughs> I can't blame him. But all right, so who's the host of it then? Like who who's the guy that you have hosting it? Uh, this guy Jake Marin, um, he's a he's a host. Um, he's was a host for Klondike for the past year he, in their like live installations, and uh, he's just one of those people that was like came out of the womb a game show host, you know, just has the <laughs> like plastered on smile and like just a happy guy. And we sort of support his uh, move into being a game show host because we're his friends and. You know, we're along for the ride, but we sort of have a different take on it being like, you know, just 
from different parts of the country and, you know, being musicians as opposed to someone who analyzes game show hosts. He <laughs> different things, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Like, um, like, what is, like, I don't know, like, for breaking down game show hosts, like, mm-hmm. who, out of the ones you've done so far in your pre-recorded episodes that you haven't, you haven't released any of them yet, correct? No, it will release no? them in October. All right. So who is the talk show host that has the most interesting breakdown so far, in your opinion? Um, I would say so far it's uh, Alex Trebek. Okay. Alex Trebek, especially like he, it, <laughs> he gives off the impression that he knows all the answers. <laughs> but like he, he he might know a lot of them, but we don't know either way. We yeah. just see this this like perfectly cut suit and these like you know hot nineties glasses, and we're just like, all right, that guy's in control. But his his persona and just the way he you know carries himself. He was in an X Files episode, uh, like as a man I in black. That one, uh, really three, yeah. <laughs> Him and Jesse Ventura uh, visit Scully as the men Jesse in black. Jesse Ventura, like uh, <laughs> Jesse the body, the body, or Jesse the, or after he became governor, it was Jesse the mind Ventura. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what he tried to switch it up to, anyway. Or uh, he was just, or he was just at, trying to find his mind again. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like got beat out of his head during wrestling years, <laughs> but you know that. That's crazy. I was thinking that you may, might say something like Steve Harvey or something like that with yeah. uh, Family Feud. Well, the Family and... Feud is going to be a whole series. Uh, that's like, a, you know, that's the deepest you can dive on a game show, I think. There's like such a sordid past and like yeah. so many different hosts. And I feel like every host bring it's like such unique. Like, remember when Peterman uh, was the host of uh, Family Feud from Seinfeld? Yeah, like, and then like <laughs> Greg Holmes and Louis Anderson too. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, and the St- and the Steve Harvey one has been he's been doing it for like ten years or something now, and that they're all just their own awesome version of it. And like, uh, you know, we're gonna talk about all of it. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to hearing that as well too. Uh, you said that's coming out in October correct yeah. are you releasing them all like in one cluster or are you gonna go we'll do it one, we'll do it once a week. yeah we're banking them now and we'll put them out once a week very cool very cool man so uh once again what is the name of that one just to sh- give it another shout out sure it's a game show gurus the game show gurus all right all right cool so look for that in october now i do have some questions that i ask my guests to help get advice to people who are looking to get into the entertainment industry Mm -hmm. all right now you seem to have your fingers in quite a few pots so you can your your question you can either choose one uh one aspect of the entertainment industry and go after it or you can kind of jump around between the entertainment industries that you're involved in but what advice do you have for somebody who's looking to get started well, in my opinion, all those different things, like the different, like music or sound or, you know, write stuff or I'm an improviser as an actor, like all those things sort of inform themselves, um, like music. And, you know, when I was playing music and touring, there's always an element of like crowd work and being writing songs. You'd maybe sort of have a sarcastic edge to certain things like jokes that within a band sort of make it up their way onto songs, whether the audience knows it or not. <laughs> so there was a lot of things and you're, you know, you're three or four people together. You have to have your own jokes, you know, you have to be kind of funny or personable to sort of deal with each other. And so I don't really see acting or music performance as a different thing. It's all, performance um okay it's just, it's just how you get there um recording or you know working in documentaries things like that is more of a way obviously to get money <laughs> but it's a way to be 
to network with people and to be on sets. Maybe I've been sound on a lot of different short films or features that, you know, I'm just happy to be in the room. Yeah. Um, And I think that's important to find places that you're happy to be and that you're excited at the possibilities of, you know, you're doing something today that you wouldn't think you'd ever do. Um, Yeah. Like what are some of the things that make you excited just to be in the room, like uh, for an event? Is it the people you're working with or the project you're working on or does it? uh... um, Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you, you find it. Sometimes it's a whole crew that works together all the time that you uh, sort of get to know each other and, you know, you branch off and you get gigs from each other and you know who to call if you need a camera guy or so forth. And um, so that's the most important part of, of moving out to L.A. and trying to work, whether you want to be an actor, or you want to be a filmmaker, whatever, you have to see it first. You know, I I couldn't get any kind of work when I first moved out here. I started doing background work, which okay. I, which I'm not above. Um, and, you know, I don't think I'd ever do it now. Uh, but I, you know, that was the first time I realized actors don't need to yell when they're acting. <laughs> like if you're on, a, you know, on NCIS or something, you see them walk over and they're freaking whispering to each other. Like you would never know that. Yeah. Unless you took an expensive class or, you know, stood next to Dan Harmon for, or uh, Mark Harmon for four hours, you know, and then you talking about the, lunch. You mean not yelling on, like in the scene, they're whispering and the mics are just picking it up. They're not talking like full volume yeah. or so. Yeah. I mean, like, so, you know, if you hadn't been on a film set before and you'd only seen, you know, actors in plays, you'd think everyone just yells their lines and it's super big where I realized okay. that the camera is going to find you like the, there's a professional behind that camera that's focusing on what your subtle reaction to something is. And that is probably more interesting than you being huge and, you know, s- sort of just trying to be the center of attention. I got you. I got you. Like in theater, you need to project more. And Mm -hmm. even uh, playing live in a band, you know, while you're on stage, you need to be that showman up front to keep the crowd's attention. But yeah, I, the whole, that had to be, did, did that take any getting used to like uh, switching from being up on a band uh, on stage as a band to being on set as an actor and bringing it down a little bit? It, It seemed like the more natural, uh, thing for me because I don't, you know, typically I don't perform big unless it's like it calls for it. Yeah. Um, I could do a lot of things that are very subtle on film that you'll pick up on that are really like sort of catch you off guard or make you laugh. Whereas if you're too big with it and you try to just force it, like, blare it over blare your music over loudspeakers at people you know they're gonna hit a wall at some point and not uh be intimate with you anymore okay all right yeah the reason why i asked if it took some getting used to is because i did radio at a rock station for seven years and like i did like concert ads and stuff like that if you go back and listen to like my first episode you're like, like when i'm doing air that, horn <laughs> when, when, I, I never did the air horn i'm like burr, burr, burr. no i wasn't i wasn't that guy but okay. uh but if you go back and listen to my first episode doing the intro like mm-hmm. when I'm doing the interview, I'm still pretty conversational, but I was like, welcome to uncontained uh, episode one. We finally yeah. launched, you know, type <laughs> thing. And it, it was, yeah, I, it was painful to go back and listen to almost, but yeah, it's like hard to get the radio out of your voice. Sometimes you have to like yeah. try. So uh, yeah, that's, that's what, what hit me when you're like uh, the different style change in acting. So mm-hmm. yeah. So, but that like, that really like, you know, and this was over like six months or so of just being back like an extra on shows or, and then I started getting like featured background stuff that like on Brooklyn nine, nine in the first season, 
I'm like wearing a potato costume and Andy Samberg does a little bit and they used it in one of the ads. So I got like a, you know, some money for it. Yeah. So it was, there was a lot of little things like that, that it really encouraged me that what I was doing. Was correct. And Could, you're uh, going in. Uh, you know what I think it is? I think it might be your headphone jack, like in and out of your computer, because I think it might be switching from your headset to your computer speakers. Okay, sorry. So, uh, it started again, like after you said, um, yep. said you were dressed in a potato costume, and you, you, okay. it cut out when you said, "I got money for it." I could kind of understand it, but it was scrambled. But okay. so, if you want to like okay. start from the potato costume again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, so I had been doing extra work, you know, when I first moved out here and I had started sort of noticing all these little subtleties and before, before not that long, I was getting like featured extra parts because, you know, I just had the right instincts in, in my opinion. And in nine, nine, the first season I was dressed in this potato costume and, you know, did a whole bit with Andy Samberg and they used it in a promo. So I got like credit for it and got okay. a little bit of money and whatnot. Little things like that would keep happening where I'd get a little bit, something extra for just being somewhat decent at acting. So I would get, little other jobs I'd get commercials um, and, you know, stand in work for people that I kind of looked like. And I would see myself, I would just be in, like I was at the Saved by the Bell reunion on the Tonight Show in, like, <laughs> Bay in Bayside High as one of the students. Like, okay. you know, you don't, you accidentally end up at these places and it just, <clears throat> it's very encouraging. Did you um, watch Saved by the Bell as a kid? Yeah, absolutely. So, so was that kind of surreal being at Bayside High, and also on the Tonight Show set? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That too. Okay, I, I thought you were on the set of Saved by the Bell. No, so Jimmy Fallon I'm, did like a whole, a little like you know when he went to Bayside High sketch, and like <laughs> you know we rehearsed it for a day and then and then filmed it, but it was like you'd never think you'd be in any kind of room like that moving to LA. Definitely. And that had to be probably one of the rooms you were just happy to be in. Right. Like, uh, yeah. that situation. I don't blame you. I'd be like, Holy shit. That's a nice show. Yeah. <laughs> it was just cool. And I was, you know, I've been happy with it, you know, whenever stuff like that happens, but also pursuing like more film things and, you know, more theatrical work over the years has been a good way of sort of like teaching me how to do the business part as well as the performance. Right on, man. Right on. Yeah. So uh, speaking business side of things, what are you mm -hmm. doing right now to uh, promote yourself, whether it's uh, to uh, casting directors or to fans? Hmm. I don't know. Anything special on social media or anything like that? No, I've I've always been sort of adverse to using social media for that sort of promotion. Um, uh, I'll be all over it when, you know, the moon shoots release a recording. But like right now, I'm just selling things to films and doing doing commissions and things like that. So it's sort of been this year of I know I have things happening and I can't wait to show everyone but i have like six different things that i means nothing yet you know what i mean <laughs> and that you can't talk about <laughs> can't talk about like the, it's you have to find a way to survive in that like year or two when you film a movie like it could take a year for you to ever see it yeah you know what i mean <clears throat> so it's been just building credits and building industry contacts has been the most helpful thing. I don't think me talking, you know, about a you know, unboxing video or something is going to be <laughs> of interest to anyone. Like I'm, you know, I'm 35. Uh, you know, I have to focus my energy on 
actually creating and just hope that works. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there you go, man. There you go. Um, all right. So you've already talked about a couple of these, but what would be a highlight or two that uh, you haven't shared yet that you would care to share with the uncontained audience? Uh, I think the the weirdest thing was there was. Um, you remember when uh, Neil Patrick Harris had like a variety show on NBC? Um, Vaguely, like- yes. And then, like, you know, so they uh, they tried out, they made a pilot of a Maya Rudolph show um, for NBC. Okay. The same thing, it was, like, a live variety show with sketches on a stage and, like, musical guests, things like that. So I was, uh, and I got, so the day before this happened, I went on a hike with a friend, and he was, like, you know, and a friend, his buddy came with us and was like, hey, you kind of look like Andy Samberg. What are you doing tomorrow? So okay. I so I get so I show up to the studio and I'm Andy Samberg standing for the for the duration this week of rehearsals. And then he would do the show live. And um, I our first day we we look we all got on stage it's me and like five other stand-ins and the director is trying to choreograph this musical number and she was just running around the stage going clapping like one two one two okay okay you're lorne michaels okay get on your get on your knees you're a car okay you're a pony you you're a pony you're a pony (laughs) you're superman fly superman fly and it's just it was the most like bizarre thing that we're like, what the, what is she even talking about? And surely enough, like there was in the opening number, there was a pony. There was like two Dutch girls. There was like all this stuff that she was just shouting at us that I thought it was like, you know, a joke. (laughs) <laughs> but all that stuff was really we were supposed to be doing yeah it's like that bad photographer like you see like you're a tiger you're a tiger give me an attitude yes yeah you eat eat them up that it's like yeah you're a pony <laughs> <laughs> you're a pony and and so and so that was kind of weird but then the last day of the rehearsals like is snl alumni and stuff and uh, it was surreal and then the stunt coordinator goes hey man you want to fly I was like, of course I want to fly. <laughs> Whatever that means. Yeah, let's do it. And that's and, when you started math. No. <laughs> well, well, they, well, I had to rehearse with this one of the harnesses on. So you get like a stump bump and everything. And I yeah. had to pretend to be Superman. And so I'm like 16 to 20 feet off the ground with this harness on. I go, I'm Superman. And they, uh, and you know, they do the sketch. And I look, I'm hanging there as they're like setting up, getting ready to take me down. And I look out in the audience and it's just Lorne Michaels and Steven Spielberg sitting next to each other. Just watching. Like, cause it was, you know, an empty theater except for those two people. And I'm just hanging there with a wedgie in a harness. (laughs) (laughs) Man, that that's quite the crowd too. Just two guys, but the reputation is big enough to fill the auditorium. Just one mm-hmm. of them. And um, I, yeah. And I'm just in the most uncomfortable position and, you know, probably wouldn't have done it if I knew they were there. So. <laughs> <laughs> right on, dude. That that's quite the story. Um, hell, I, you know, if I if I had a chance to put on the harness and hang in front of uh, Spielberg and uh, Lauren Michaels, you, you never know. I, I, I'd probably do it. Why not? You, you won't lose anything. <laughs> That's true. Dignity, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. But no, <laughs> who, who has that anymore? Uh, <laughs> I'm, we're just ponies, all right? At this point. I know, yeah. You're a pony. You're Superman. You're a trolley. <laughs> or like, however the hell it is. It's like you're doing motion capture or something. Um, which, I, which I would do. That seems like fun. Yeah, actually had uh, somebody on the show who was, uh, his name's Jarrell Hall. He was two of the dragons in Game of Thrones along with the White Walker. So it sounds like a pretty sweet job. He's like, I get to go to work and pretend all day. You know, (laughs) it's like I get to go play Mm make-believe. I mean, anytime I get to do any kind of acting gig or performance, it like, it really is like a cleansing fun exciting thing and you know as long as it's fun and exciting i'll still do it 
Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. yeah. So when you do perform and, um, you know, your your stuff finally gets out in front of the audience. Mm-hmm. As you were talking, it takes a while to get stuff out. What is it that you want the audience to take away from your performance? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I just don't. I don't want them to uh, see what I'm actually thinking about. You know, I I don't. I, I want it <laughs> to like ring as true as possible and. You know, I'm I'm very sort of tough on myself, but once it's I I trust everything that happens after I deliver the lines. Okay, I trust, I trust editors and directors, and like you know, if something's not working, you gotta trust your director because it's out of your hands. And I just want to continue working with people that know what to look for in me. If that makes sense. I like okay. when you really like get along with the director or like, you know, someone that's casting something like they start seeing things in you that you didn't necessarily notice. And I want to, I don't know. I don't really act the way I act now. I don't, I don't typically act in films. Uh, okay. I'm a lot more reserved and a lot more, um, I don't know. Just I just play a, a lot more real <laughs> than you would necessarily expect. Fair enough, man. So it yeah. seems like uh, you're more fo- – well, obviously you want the audience not to feel like you're acting, that you're actually yeah. doing that. But a lot of it sounds like where you want to leave the biggest impression is with the people that you're working with. I just – I think that's the best way to have – if if the guy behind the camera likes you personally – He's good. It's you're gonna see that through the lens. If everyone on set hates you, or like you're just you know kind of difficult or not really on that day, like you can feel that, and yeah, you, you can see that watching a movie. If like someone was maybe uncomfortable or not into the scene, or uh, I strive to never have that. You know, I if you get along with the people you work with, the person behind the camera, you, they, they want you to look good. You know, they want to find that little, uh, you know, thing that you improvised with your face. And like, I like to throw in like the sort of subtle things like quirks or, um, you know, little things I'll improvise that aren't, are subtle, but I'll almost, always see them in the final cut yeah all right cool do you think do you think your attitude towards cameramen and directors and stuff like that goes back to your music production and having to work with artists because you know they always say the sound guy can hit the suck button real quick (laughs) yeah (laughs) Uh, exactly if you don't if, if it's three in the morning and you're trying to you know finish your verse on a song or something and the people you're in the room with aren't in it and don't believe in you. It's like the night feels like it'll never end. You know, you're watching the clock and you don't, I don't want to be in that environment ever. If it, if it's already like that, I'll go in do my thing. You know, there's nothing you could do to change it, but yes, exactly. I, I remember being, in the middle of the night on sessions that feel felt like they were going really well. And you had a good rapport with the artist and it felt like a collaboration. You didn't notice that the sun came up. Yeah. And it, if it's, if it's something that's like pulling teeth, you know, you're just collecting data essentially and just slicing it together and you can't wait to go home. And I don't right. ever want to work like that again. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because when when you were telling me the story about the talking about the cameraman, that's all I was like that was running yeah. through my head about the sound guy and don't piss off the sound guy. Don't piss off the sound guy. Yeah, <laughs> sure. All I mean, right, man. sound guys are pretty cranky by nature, so um, I they're usually <laughs> they're probably pissed off anyway. So just you know, give them a coffee. Yeah, 
There you go, man. There you go. All right. Well, I actually only have one more question left for you. But first, uh, I know you said you weren't a big social media guy, but you want to throw out your social medias at all or where people can find you uh, information about uh, the Hanukkah movie and uh, also your upcoming podcast or the moon shoots. Yeah. So uh, I'm uh, at BFEL2. That's B-F-E-L and then the number two. Um, that's my personal, uh, you know, again, I, I don't like people to just find me. So I, I made it as difficult as possible <laughs> to find my name. Uh, so at the moon shoots on Instagram and Facebook and all that, um, at, um, at Hanukkah killer, uh, for Hanukkah, the movie, uh, I swear it's just going to appear one day. Um, and, um, game show gurus pod. Okay, cool. So uh, I do have a question about the Hana killer. Is that actually based off a true uh, story or an actual legend, or is that uh, new with this movie? Um, I think it's just for fun. <laughs> just for fun. All right. You know, you never know where some of these stories come from. I don't know if it was based on some serial killer or something in the past or something like that. All right. Hey, Robert, man, it's been great talking to you, uh, jumping around from talking about game shows to uh, Hanukkah murder movies. And uh, and one thing I didn't expect was uh, the Compton documentary and Murders Inc. But you, you got me by surprise on that one. But I have one final question for you. All okay. right. Robert Felstead Jr., how do you live uncontained? Um, I live uncontained by um, going with my instincts. I've, I like, probably like a lot of other people who choose to pursue the arts in some way. Um, I had the, the, the day job mentality at one point and, uh, even, you know, instead of scraping by playing gigs and recording and things like that, I moved on to just getting by tending bar, which it had the same result. I was broke anyway. You know, it didn't never <laughs> amounted to enough money to matter in my life. So when I, moved you know sort of moved back to music and moved to la to sort of say you know this is exactly what i'm doing um i sort of just looked at every thing i could grasp onto as an opportunity so finding finding something where it's at this point almost effortless i have i can you know i have film people that uh filmmakers that do documentaries and you know they they just sort of hit me up and i do it at a at my own discretion um okay i, I only choose pro projects that are fulfilling to me and whether it's financially or uh creatively ideally you can marry the two and make money doing something that you care about. And that's finally really after, you know, almost 10 years of making music and gigging. And um, I'm at, I feel like I'm at the point where I can, I've only chosen to do things I like. And that is freedom to me. That is. Yeah. That's a good spot to be. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's what I love. I, there's film projects that I prioritize in my free time, I think of songs and play my guitar and record it and, you know, always have a few different projects going. It's not as fulfilling as what I thought getting a job or playing in a band and touring would be because that was always serving the venue or you're serving yeah. the people you're with or you're compromising in some way. I have stopped compromising. And that's where I'm at. Nice. Nice. Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, thank you for uh, sharing. I guess I do have one question on that. What was it that, what was the key moment that switched your mind from, as you mentioned, the day job uh, mentality to uh, going all in on the arts? 
Um, honestly, it was because, you know, I'd imagine anyone that pursues acting has some level of guilt about it. Or like, you know, is like, oh, man, I don't want to tell people I'm an actor. <laughs> you know? Oh, great. You're an actor. Uh, you know, I, I feel like my life up till now has informed what I put into performances in, in film or whatever. You know, I wouldn't know what it's like to be, you know, a broke person if I didn't experience it, you know, or if I didn't, if I had just been a musician or an actor, I wouldn't have any other life experience. So, yeah. um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, no problem, man. No problem. What was the like moment? Oh, yeah. or what was the deciding factor? Yeah. Um, so I was having sort of trouble getting a job in LA and my wife, you know, saw me all stressed out in our apartment. Um, and she was like, you know, you know, you're an actor now, right? This is just, this is clearly what makes you happy. You're good at it and you are able to book work somehow. So until you're not happy anymore, this is what you do. Nice. Yeah. So, so I mean, you have that little push that helps you get there. Yeah. And, you know, you sort of stress out about bills and everything. And, you know, I was making money, but it what didn't, it, there was that thing where you're supposed to be more responsible than this, you know, <laughs> <laughs> in your I mind. You. And it just, you know, after a certain amount of time, she was like, just, you're doing it. Don't worry about it. Nice, nice. And then, All right. And then I sort of focused on that and that became my job. Awesome, man. Awesome. That's a good place to be. I appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, I have uh, one final thing to do. And uh, that is ask you to sign off the show. Would you do me the honor of signing off the show tonight, Robert? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, my name is Robert Felstead Jr. And I live uncontained. And that does it for another episode of Uncontained. Thank you for listening, and thank you to Robert for joining me and uh, sharing all the insight that he did, all the great advice and stories. And, uh, yeah, uh, Hanukkah, the Hanukkah killer, definitely going to want to check that movie out. Looking forward to it dropping. I'll put a link to the trailer in the show notes so you can uh, take a look and see for yourself. It'll be a fun horror movie to check out. Make sure you follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter for updates on the movie. I'll let you know uh, when I get word that it will be in theaters or how the release will happen. So add me, follow me, and I will get you more information. And uh, yeah, thanks again for listening. And until next time.